Okay, so getting into the Permian and the Carboniferous today, on the title slide, we're going to get to it today, uh, is one of Idaho's absolute specialities, the buzzsaw shark. Many, many, many people in Idaho who don't maybe know too much about paleontology probably know that Idaho has the Hagerman horse, the horse that's the first horse down on one hoof. It's our state fossil. I think our state fossil probably should be Helicoprion, which is the buzzsaw shark. This is a shark that's a perfect fossil taxon in the sense that it like challenges you. It makes you say, what? It makes you be like, how does that work? And the great part is, is like, you don't get to know. You can study it and try to figure it out. And it's about the limits of your imagination because this is a taxon that lived for tens of millions of years and there's several species. So it's not just a fluke. And it's weird And Idaho has the most specimens of this animal of anywhere in the world by a lot. So right down campus, we've got a lot of these. You guys will see them in lab later this year. But okay, we're not starting there. I want to go back to this, because uh, I didn't get to talk to you guys about the Devonian slide and the Carboniferous summary slide, so I wanted to get you back in here uh, and kind of go over this stuff. The Carboniferous is increasingly, in the modern day, 2024, uh, a really interesting period in the evolution of vertebrates. Uh, we've always known that a lot of the diversity of tetrapods, the oldest amphibian lineages, the oldest reptile and mammal lineages, all are in the Carboniferous. And that's getting increasingly well fleshed out in part by research that's actually happening here, which is really exciting. You guys will hear about it. Um, this is also a really important time to humans. I talked about it in the YouTube video, right? This is where so much of the original like coal that humans burned in the 1800s and into the 1900s came from is this carbon iferous period. It's a super interesting planet. Pangea, the supercontinent is beginning to coalesce. It's, we don't technically call it Pangea quite yet, but it's getting there. Um, big ice age happening in the Carboniferous. And so the southern continents, this is now Australia, Antarctica, India, Madagascar, Southern Africa, Southern South America, a little bit, are getting glaciated. Super interesting. But at the equator, what's now North America and Europe uh, is dominated by these giant, cold, what we call coal swamps. These like, if you got out of your time machine and walked around in them, there's a lot of things that look like trees, but there's a lot of plants that are going to be really surprising to you. And none of the lineages of plants, like vascular plants, plants with like tall tissues, pines and spruces and flowering plants, none of those exist yet. So these are all these very interesting, different kinds of plants. This thing right here is a great example. If you want to learn more about these forests, you can talk to Henry. He did work on this master, or his undergrad on these coal forests and how they uh, were distributed across that supercontinent, which is really interesting. There's giant bugs. I'm sorry, we didn't get to talk about giant bugs in person. Um, but we're going to be focusing mostly on the vertebrates, of course, today. And I call this lecture like Carboniferous and Permian like Biodiversity. We're going to try to get through a lot of the like clades of vertebrates you guys have met so far, what they're looking like, what's going on in their different lineages during the Carboniferous. Anybody have any questions or observations about the Carboniferous before I just jump through? You saw this on the YouTube, but it's pretty fun. I really like that the sub periods are called Mississippian and Pennsylvanian because that's where Americans found coal and we're like, okay, well. <laughs> okay, nobody's bothered by the giant bugs. I love them. <laughs> okay. So here's that kind of what I'm talking about here. We're going to start to lose our like one tree approach in this class. Basically, ever since we saw chordates and vertebrates, you guys have seen an ever expanding tree that holds all the vertebrates and has things like hagfish and lamprey and things like sharks and tetrapods. We are now going to have to break and you guys are going to have to do your best in your notes and looking back at the slides to like put the trees back together again because I'm going to have to not be able to show you all the reptiles and all the mammals and all the sharks on the same slide. It gets to be too much. But here's our kind of refresher on where we are. We talked about the end Devonian mass extinction on Tuesday. We are now up into the Carboniferous. You can see at the end of the Devonian, some were already on their way out, but we end up losing so, so many of these early lineages, placoderms, different acanthodian lineages, lots of those jawless fishes are gone by the end of the Devonian. And so the Carboniferous fauna at a glance is the one that really starts to, at the biggest zoom out level, look like a lot of the animals you guys already know. Hagfish and lampreys are around, conodonts, which are not alive anymore, but they're still there. They're the only other jawless fish lineage left. This is a modern group. This is a modern group. These are all modern groups. They have their origins in the Silurian. They radiate in the Devonian. But in the Carboniferous is when we lose so many of these other early vertebrate groups that made things so crazy and prehistoric looking. Now when I show you pictures of fishes, paleo of the oceans, you guys are going to be like, because there's not giant armor stuff swimming around everywhere. So this is the Carboniferous. Just to put it up there. Uh, this was our expansion of Tetrapodomorpha. 
So taking this lineage here in Sarcopterygians, sister to lungfish, Tetrapodomorpha, you guys met some of these fishes uh, last week when we talked about the land transition, which happens during the Devonian. When we get up into here, there are still tetrapodomorph fishes in the Carboniferous, which is very weird, as well as all those true tetrapods. And so here's a blow up of just the tetrapod part of that tree. So again, here's our Devonian, here's our Devonian mass extinction. And you guys met some of these guys uh, on the video lecture. I think these animals are inherently interesting. I hope you did too. Animals that are true tetrapods, but a lot of them are living aquatic lifestyles. They're living Sarcopterygian fish lifestyles, even though they've got little thingies and little toesies. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, and again, the value of the fossil record is to break up these different synapomorphies and understand the sequence of evolution. There's a lot more characters. We can put in all these nodes to help us understand all these tetrapod animals. So if you remember our land transition, six of them were here. And then things like Acanthostega and Ichthyostega that had too many fingers and still had tail fins. That's obviously stuff that changes later, a reduction of the digits, a loss of the tail fin, and it keeps going and going. And that's what fossils can really do for us, right? So what I'd like to have you do now, because I didn't get a chance to really talk about this with you, is just look at this Carboniferous and Permian distribution of tetrapods, animals on land maybe, in the water sometimes, all with arms and legs. This is their gestalt, their different appearances. Talk to your neighbors, make some observations. What are you noticing? What looks funny or interesting to you? I just care to hear because I missed you guys on Tuesday. Okay, go ahead. in the early mid Mississippi that we don't yeah. have the best but the only thing here I need to All right, I'm not really looking for anything specific right now. I'm just really curious. Anything you guys observe? Question? Funny thing? A trend towards terrestrial environments uh, leads to less, um, uh, less uh, <laughs> hydrodynamic morphology. <laughs> okay. Like fishes are all kind of like a streamlined shape for moving yeah. through the water. You can get a little bizarre, a little more sprawled out, uh, a little less. Yeah, we could say hydrodynamic. Most of these animals aren't going fast enough to really worry about being aerodynamic. Right. <laughs> Lots of tetrapods eventually really care about being aerodynamic, but probably not these way. <laughs> probably not yet. What else? I think Diplocalus would fly. You think Diplocalus? I was talking about this one with the boomerang head. <laughs> if it ran fast enough, it could fly, you think, maybe? Okay. I will say I was surprised. I did not think that uh, that is Diplocalus right now. Yeah. Diplocalus. Oh, geez. I mean, I mean, who knows? <laughs> I don't know which cartoon that's supposed to be. The boomerang. The I'm boomerang. Surprised. Has, right? I, not, uh, I thought that they would be, um, I assumed that they were closer to uh, 
Less amphibians. Yeah, so less amphibians are today's amphibians, the living frogs and salamanders and, and some other guys we'll meet today. So here's today's amphibians. And then this bar right here represents today's mammals and today's reptiles. So I'm going to break that up later next for next week. So today's reptiles and mammals, today's amphibians, and there's all this other diversity. And so, yeah, this thing is always in the water. It's a very much living an amphibious life. Uh, you'd have to like really show me a lot of very convincing data to show me it doesn't basically live a salamander life. But yeah, it is, this is not controversial, closer to amniotes, mammals, and or reptiles today than it is to today's amphibians. So another thing I like about this slide that I hope maybe can puncture through for you guys, I, whenever I make these, I'm always aware I'm like overwhelming you. It's too many names, you know, all this detail. You don't ever need this. I'm never gonna ask you to like repeat this back to me for like a grade. I just like to show you this so you can use it as a resource and really kind of see like, again, it's not like a fish that flopped on the land and now there's frogs and monkeys and birds. It's like, look at all this diversity that has nothing to do with today's amphibians or today's amniotes that obviously was doing all kinds of interesting things ecologically, body size wise, biodiversity wise. We, we're not talking about geography where these things live. There's all kinds of really awesome patterns we can get from the fossil record about carboniferous diversity and Permian diversity. And so it's really not like Today's amphibians are like the in-between of fishes and mammals and reptiles. They are their own weird kind of amphibious thing. And there's tons of other lineages of amphibious tetrapods that lived their lives and are gone now. And so, you know, just like we talked about in the Cambrian, what if that one had lived and what if that one had gone extinct? You can think that basically every time you see a slide like this. And it's really, I think, inherently cool. These animals, Gephyrus stegids, are really blow people's minds because they really, really seem like they're lizards. They're really well terrestrially adapted, but they totally have all these features of their brain case and their skeletons. They're like, no, no, that's where they go phylogenetically. But they're really terrestrial. They really do live on land very well. That's cool because this is where modern animals and reptiles are going to be. So anyway, anything else? I like how swimmy so many of them obviously are still. Plenty of aquatic life. And you have to remember that a lot of the places we get our fossils, especially in the Carboniferous, are these like seasonally or maybe like episodically flooded swamps and forests. And so their habitat, there's a lot of water around as far as we know. So we assume we don't have great direct evidence for most of these sites. We are assuming we're making an inference that most of their reproductive biology is still tied to water pretty heavily. And I think that's very safe to assume that. I would need to see evidence to show me they weren't, but I believe it if you did show me. Um, for some of the clays, I think. All right. I also just think it's a bunch of fun little faces. These are faces of Earth that are gone now. So <laughs> take them in. But let's focus in on grounding ourselves and what we already might know about. So list amphibians are today's amphibians. When some, somebody says amphibian, you guys probably think of a bullfrog or you think of a salamander. So let's talk about today's amphibians. And so we can take those same characters, the same synapomorphies that we learned, the eight synapomorphies for tetrapoda, put them on the modern tree. So here's animals that are all alive right now that you can go see with your binoculars or catch in your hands uh, and how they're distributed. Tetrapoda has, is a monophyletic clade, a common ancestor in all the descendants of tetrapods. One side is amphibia, a very specific kind of amphibian, lists amphibians. And the other side, amniotes, which we're not going to talk about this week. So let's start with the list amphibians. Today's frogs, salamanders, and those weird dudes, the Sicilians, these wormy guys. So there's a lot of species of amphibian today. 8380 is the last count of species. That's way more species of list amphibians than there are of mammals. Most list amphibians today are frogs. So 7,600 species of frogs, that number has ballooned like crazy in the last 15 or 20 years as people have used genetics to understand frog evolution. And so seen that there's tons of species sitting right in front of our eyes. And so this is a hugely uh, blowing up number that's definitely uh, valid and that's very exciting. So frogs, I feel like I don't have to explain what frogs are to you. <laughs> we'll see them in lab next week. Uh, frogs are these uh, amphibians. The other group of amphibians you guys probably know about are salamanders. Things like newts are also salamanders, a kind of salamander. So you can see there's like an order of magnitude, fewer salamander species than there are frog species. Salamanders are also really well distributed. Fun factoid for you all might be that North America and the United States in particular is like the absolute highest diversity of salamanders anywhere in the world. So places like Tennessee and the Southeast of this country have the highest salamander diversity of anywhere. It's not like if you go to the Amazon or the Congo, you're going to find more salamanders than here. No, Tennessee and <laughs> the southeast of this country. 
And then the last group of living amphibians that a lot of people aren't that familiar with, some of you maybe have heard of them, are called Caecilians. So they have that AE at the beginning, Caecilians. Caecilians are totally limbless. There are plenty of salamanders, actually, that have also lost their limbs, which is confusing. But Caecilians are a limbless lineage of amphibians today. They almost all live in completely tropical wet forests. There are Caecilians in the Congo. There are Caecilians in, you know, uh, Latin America and like the warm, wet jungles. They live in the leaf litter. They're all predators. You maybe haven't heard of them. We're definitely going to talk about them. You can see they're nowhere near as diverse, biodiversity-wise, number of species-wise, as frogs and much less than salamanders. But that's just to ground you. Here's our living amphibians. Here's how they're related to one another. Salamanders and frogs are sister. Cecilians are the outgroup. We know that really well, uh, basically from their anatomy. We've known that for a long time, but the DNA totally confirms it. So we know these are their relationships. That clade, monophyletic clade, common ancestor and all descendants, this amphibia includes all three of these. And then if you really care and you love your herps, which is what we call things like uh, amphibians and reptiles today, uh, Batrachia is the name of the clade that unites the frogs and the salamanders together to the exclusion of Caecilians. So when we get into dinosaur times, a lot of cool evolution will be happening right here, and we'll talk about things that are like stem Batrachians. That's not yet, not in the Carboniferous. So here's some Caecilian slides. Before I say anything about Caecilians, these are all photos, obviously, of living organisms. Before I say anything about Caecilians, maybe you've never heard of these animals before, maybe you have. Uh, talk to your neighbors, tell me about Caecilians. <laughs> You gotta be careful not to say Sicilians like the humans, yeah. <laughs> but say Sicilians. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, uh, you don't have to put your hand up if you don't want to, but I'm just curious. Has anybody never heard of these animals before? Okay, we got some people. Good, that's great. Uh, so what are we noticing about Caecilians? Their formal name is Apoda, which means no feet. <laughs> They're limbless, right? What are some things? Yeah, they're a lot like earthworms. A lot like earthworms. They're called very wormy things. We're going to meet a Triassic Sicilian later in class. Uh, and its name is Funkus Firmus, which means funky worm. <laughs> um, okay, what else? I agree with you. They look like annelid segmented worms, for sure. They do. Teeth. Teeth. Tell me about the teeth. Very good. Teeth. Come on, all native domes have teeth. What's the problem? But right, pretty scary teeth, right? Pretty fun teeth. So all Sicilians are carnivores. This, like this species in particular, is the one that has the gnar pretty gnarly teeth. This looks like those worms that uh, are in Beetlejuice and kind of like the older Dune adaptations. <laughs> because that's what Sicilians always remind me of. Although they're only this big, so not quite the same. So very much predators in the leaf litter, eating things like uh, arthropods, eating things like annelid worms for sure. Uh, segmented worms like earthworms, slithering around. What else? 
notice that some have eyes and some don't. Well, yeah. I don't even know if those eyes are super functional. Right? So there's a huge variety in, in their vision. So like this one has almost no uh, eyes to speak of at all. So they're living down in the leaf litter, down in the like loose dirt, very high in the soil. So like they are burrowing. So oftentimes you guys will see again and again and again in mammals and in reptiles and in and other amphibians, these amphibians, burrowing animals often lose their sight. It's kind of like animals that live in caves. After long enough, you're adapting to the environment and you might not need that. You're, uh, it's expensive to make eyeballs. And so eyeball loss is a pretty common thing for cave dwelling animals, burrowing animals. Um, also, if you're facing the dirt all the time, your eyes are a very sensitive structure. Anybody else know anything about Sicilians? Any Sicilian fun facts out there in the audience? Yeah? I've heard that the young uh, like eat the mother's skin. That's what's happening here. Here's a mother caring for her babies, her little mass of babies. And one of the things that early on biologists notice in Sicilians is this very mammalian thing. Not only are these amphibians caring for their babies for a while after the babies hatch, but what the mother does is she grows extra layers of skin and then the babies use those teeth that they have and they just go like this and they eat that. Now you guys are all drinking like modified sweat from breasts when you're little and you don't think that's gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a very interesting other thing where from the body of the mother, she's producing nutrients that she gives to her young while they're with her where they go off and live their life which is very fun and probably not something you're expecting from a weird worm that you've never seen before. Something I like about Sicilians is they have a lot of chemosensory. They have really excellent senses of smell. Some of them have these like little tentacles even to expand their ability to smell things when they're running around. So there's Sicilians. They don't exist back in the Carboniferous. Their lineage doesn't even really start till the Triassic in terms of its fossils and like the specific lineage uh, that are called Sicilians. But we're introducing today's amphibians just to ground us. Okay. Very derived, obviously, they've lost all their legs, they have a poor fossil record. What's really interesting is that there's been some controversy in the last few years of which of all these amphibian groups that are alive in the Carboniferous and alive in the Permian and alive in the Triassic, Sicilians might be related to. Genomic data tells us really, really, really convincingly that like you get frogs and salamanders for sure, and Sicilians are not very far away. But when you look at all the things that are alive, all the amphibians that are alive back when they would have diversified, Putting Sicilians somewhere with confidence among the things we do have fossils for has been challenging. I'm getting more and more comfortable with the best answer right now, but two years ago, I would have told you something different. So this is an ongoing place of research. It's really interesting to me. You guys can probably imagine what kind of things would make it difficult to identify an early Sicilian, probably easy to identify a living one. But okay, there's our list of amphibians right there. There are a couple of characters, because Sicilians don't have a good fossil record, I gave them to you biodiversity-wise first. Now I want to talk about the characters of the skeleton that unite this big group of amphibians that our modern group is a part of. And so the modern list amphibians are absolutely a subset of this much, much, much bigger radiation of animals we all could definitely call amphibians, called temnospondyls. So temnospondyls are super successful in the Carboniferous, the Permian, and the Triassic. They go on for a while after that. Uh, temnos, as they're called colloquially, you might hear me say temnos sometime, have a lot of morphological features we can look at and really excellent fossil records. So there's two characters that unite all of temnospondyls. They're almost certainly true of Sicilians, but it's hard to place those. Here's those two features. The first synapomorphy for this big clade of amphibians is interterrigoid vacuities. We missed lab this week because of me, sorry about that. So you guys might not know what a pterygoid is. A pterygoid is a skull bone, it's on the roof of your mouth. And uh, here's a pterygoid bone in a modern, or sorry, this is a reconstruction of a fossil amphibian today. Here's these two pterygoid bones. And the vacuities are these two really huge open spaces on the roof of the mouth. Kind of imagine like soft palate tissue on the roof of the mouth there. Those interterygoid vacuities are really easy to diagnose. When you find a fossil, it's really easy to tell if it has interterygoid vacuities. I like this character because interterygoid vacuities allow some living amphibians, frogs and salamanders, to do something that you guys have seen before but probably not thought of, which is this. When a frog like blinks, its eyeballs sink down into that vacuity, into that open space. So there's plenty of frogs and toads do this very well that like, and it's true, swallow with their eyes. 
They get a big bug in their mouth. It's all feisty. They're trying to crunch it. And then when they go to swallow it, they're blinking because their eyes are helping push the food in <laughs> their throat, which is really cool. So interterrigoid vacuities are a osteological, a bony feature that's easy to see in fossils. In living forms, we know that like they can do things like this because they have those big open spaces in the roof of their mouth, which is pretty funny. You guys have seen cartoons your whole life where frogs blink into their bodies and maybe not thought about it too much. So that's interterrigoid vacuities. And then the other character that unites all temnospongles, and presumably would be true of the earliest Sicilian, but we don't have those, is on their little hands, they only have four digits. So something that I think is very, very cool is we can see in the fossil record that the common ancestor of all tetrapods has five fingers and five toes. There's tons of lineages that modify that pattern over time. Temnospondyls, actual amphibians, do it really early. Still have five on the foot, but on the hand, there's only four, it's these four, it's only four digits. And so salamanders today have got four, frogs today have four. Five on the feet in both, but only four in the hand. So that's also something that's really helpful, really easy to find if you get a full skeleton of an animal. So interterrigoid vacuities and four digits on the hand are temnospondyl features that salamanders and frogs inherit. All right, let's talk about some fossil temnospondyls because they are super, super, super cool. Uh, there are well over 300 species of animals I'm gonna call temnos, so amphibians in the Carboniferous, the Permian, the Triassic, and actually a little bit beyond. Um, that do not include, I'm talking about paraphyletic temnospondyls right now, paraphyletic temnospondyls, so not including the, the frogs and salamanders and Sicilians, about 300 species. You can see there's lots of variable ecologies, body sizes, skull shapes, things they're doing, and oftentimes temnospondyls can have really excellent fossils. This is a really gorgeous specimen. You can see the soft tissue there of the forearm. Those teeny little bones are almost floating because this is an aquatic animal. So big old fat arm with bones kind of floating in the middle of it. And this big expanded tail, this is a skin expansion of the tail so it can swim around really well. Really, really fun. Really good temnospondyl fossils start about in the middle of the Carboniferous and go on and on and on for quite a bit. So let's talk about some temnospondyls. Here's two of the absolute earliest middle Carboniferous temnospondyl fossils we have, Valenerpeton and Denverpeton. Denverpeton, Dender is tree. Denverpeton was found inside one of like the logs from one of those coal forests, like washed up into the log itself. So it comes from this little tree. What's really cool is both of these animals, we have fossils of their adults, they're very terrestrial. They don't seem to have any tail fins or anything like that. And they have really well ossified, meaning like not as much cartilage, more bone on the endochondral elements in their limbs, their forelimbs and their hind limbs. They're able to walk around on land. So this is really interesting. Even the earliest temnospondyls are showing us that sort of transition. Um, how they breathe and how they hear are really important features of amphibians today that set them apart from other land living tetrapods, I mean, namely mammals like us and things like reptiles. So we'll talk about that here in a second. How they breathe. They do this thing called buccal pumping. All these amphibians do this today and we do infer based on the shoulder girdle structure of the ribs we see in the old, old, old temnospondyls that this is the ancestral way of breathing on land as a tetrapod for amphibians. So buccal pumping is throat pumping. They're going like this. If you guys see a frog, it's not that common to see frogs and salamanders here in Idaho, unfortunately, you have to really go find them. But if you ever see a frog, look, it's always kind of doing this with its throat. So something you can think about is fishes and uh, aquatic vertebrates that might not be fishes anymore. When they're moving through the water, they're bringing water across their gills all the time. And so they're oxygenating all the time. It's a passive process. If you move, you're also breathing effectively. If you're on land, that's not how it works anymore. You have to come up with ways to bring, it's one of the challenges we talked about, like living on land, how are you gonna respire? Maybe you use your lung, your ancestral osteichthyan lung, but you still have to get the air in. And how frogs and salamanders do it is they pump their throats. They don't do what you and I do, where we bring in our whole chest cavity in and out. They pump their throats to bring in oxygen. That's pretty cool. The other thing that frogs and salamanders do, and frogs do it actually in a really, really, really specialized way, is modify bones in the back of their skull to articulate with a muscle that's attached to their shoulder blade, believe it or not. And then they have this outer membrane. It's called a tympanic membrane. It's like an eardrum. You have something that's completely different in terms of its homology, but functions the same way. A structure that can have airborne sound hit it, and then it vibrates. And frogs do that 
I don't know if you guys ever really thought about this before. You've probably seen these big circles on frogs when you hold them or if you see them. That's their big old external eardrum. Underneath it, there's a muscle and a bone that like resonate that frequency into the brain, which is really cool. And the fact that the muscle attaches their shoulder girdle to their skull is wild. And I hope you guys can see, we've been talking a little bit in the land transition of how like the gill art, the gill architecture and the skull architecture are really integrated. So your frogs have this muscle that's still connecting those two that they used to hear with. Some of these early fossils, especially Dendropotan, that's why this art artist put in this little circle there, have this, have like the incision in their bone, like a little uh, carving away in their bone on the back of their skull that will let us know there was a tympanum sitting there. Super, super cool. Okay, so you can see once we get into temnospondyls, it's not like, you know, it's simple. There's tons of different kinds of temnospondyls, these early amphibians and the Carboniferous and the Permian. So we're gonna go up the two sides of the tree here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, I think, is take a left, yes, and talk about the uh, what I'm going to call the stereospondyl side of the tree, so this side of the tree. Do me a favor, uh, talk to your neighbors for a second, make some observations about stereospondyl uh, line uh, temnospondyls. These are some of the, oh, I won't say anything else. Tell me what you think, make some observations, questions, things like that. <laughs> Probably I even say one of them. That <laughs> 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 All right, what are some things that just jump out to you, maybe? Seem interesting. Get some diversity in skull shape going on. A lot of diversity in skull shape. You know, you got kind of these like stubby faces, longer faces, very longer faces. Paranasuchus and all of its relatives are like one of my favorites because it just looks like if you imagined like a frog crocodile monster, mm -hmm. like it has that long face, but it's uh, amphibian. I like this. I put this skull here, right? I try to put some fossils on all these slides too. So this is Rhinosuchus. Here's Rhinosuchus's skull upside down. And there's these big inner pterygoid vacuities right here that all Temnos have. I like these big guys because it's fun to imagine them doing like the blink thing because they're some of them are quite large. How large are they? Well, Paranosuchus is one of the ones that we don't have its full body, but based on its relatives, we have an idea of what its body plan should be. And some of these estimates may be a little high, but a pretty reasonable estimate for Paranosuchus is something like that. Wow. So several meters long. So this is something that you're gonna think of like when you go to take a drink, like probably is doing very crocodile things to you ecologically, <laughs> but it is an amphibian. So a lot of Paranosuchus specimens that are found, this animal is almost totally known from Brazil, are the, about this size grade, but there's chunks, fragments of Paranosuchus that are this size. So it's very cool to wonder about its ecology and its life. Eriops is a very terrestrial animal. Adult Eriops are up on land, lumbering around. This paleo art, when it came out, was very popular. Everyone calls Eriops this. Since this paleo art came out on social media, people call Eriops the murder banana because it, <laughs> it's got a very, very, very intense mouth of teeth, very strong reinforced skull. It's probably able to grab onto prey and really hold it on land, um, even though it is an amphibian animal. And I do think lumbering is a good word for Eriops. It's very stout. Um, big animal, very cool. So the stereospondyl side of the tree, here's what I would say about them. Almost all pretty large animals, medium to very large predators. Some of them are aquatic, some of them are terrestrial. So there's no marine stereospondyls uh, at this time, right? It's all, as you guys might imagine, if you know anything about modern amphibian biology, these animals are not really tolerant, we don't think of very much salinity. So freshwater predators 
I'm a carpenter person in the Permian, but Ariops and other members of the group sometimes are probably living very terrestrially as adults, which is very cool and maybe somewhat surprising. They do a lot of things in their skeleton we're not gonna talk about today, uh, you, but you can see processes on their ribs and in their shoulders to like be upright and be living land lives. We're gonna see reptiles and mammal relatives do totally different things to be like more fully out of the water all the time. Animals like this do that. They get huge body size. They weigh hundreds of pounds. They reinforce their skeleton, their structure in different ways, which is totally what you'd expect, right? Because they have different ancestry. All right, so what about the other side of the tree? This is the side of the tree that actual lists amphibians, frogs and salamanders and Sicilians are on, is the other side of the tree. Here's some early uh, of those temnospondyls. And again, I'll have you guys talk to each other, make some observations about uh, these amphibians. You can do a little compare and contrast if you want with what you just saw. Yeah. All right. Any inferences, observations, questions, anything? Yeah. So there's a, a burning question in my mind. It's like, where does metamorphosis come into this? Like, oh yeah. my goodness. So what what's metamorphosis? Well, like you start with the, the tadpole without the legs and the gills and tail, and it like turns into a frog and loses some of the features. Yeah. So one of the things you, you guys probably know about tadpoles. Um, so salamanders and frogs have tadpoles. Sicilians don't have tadpoles. One of the features, if you're just somebody who only has the three living groups when you're trying to figure stuff out, what's the deal? So something you definitely can see in this group, I'll put it up, is that there's actually several different lineages that have nothing to do, we think, with modern list amphibians. These branchiosaurs do not have a close position on the tree to modern amphibians that are quite clearly undergoing metamorphosis. There's these big lakes, fossil lakes in, in parts of Europe, especially Germany, where you can see like the teeniest little tadpole looking ones. They're not tadpole like frogs. Like a baby frog is like a head with a tail. They're never quite that extreme. That's a very derived tadpole. But they're definitely way more aquatic. They maybe have bushy gills. Sometimes those gills are retained in the adults. You guys have probably seen pictures from the living world of salamanders that adults who still keep their gills, they breathe underwater. Patterns of that keeping juvenile features into your sexual maturity, into your body size maturity, that happens back now. Totally transitioning to an adult form, that happens back then. These reproductive ecologies, life history strategies, we would call them, are definitely variable and diverse even back now. So these animals are, this is like two different stages in Branchiosaurus, um, and there's a lot of really excellent fossils of them. You can see very aquatic little babies. This one's really wonderful, right? You can see the outline of the tail. You can even see the little pile where it's like little gut contents were full of little bugs, all that carbon, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So really interesting, right? Different head shapes. This is a skeleton of an animal from Russia, and it has like its little early gill branch structures right here in this form that we think is an adult. So that's what lets us reconstruct it with like, obviously some kind of metamorphosis did happen. That's very interesting. These are smaller animals in a very general, overly simplified way. A lot of them in the Carboniferous are very aquatic. That means they're living in the water even as adults. Tremor arachis is a Permian animal. It's very famous. Its fossils come from Texas and you find hundreds of them dead together, probably because their pond dried up and they're all at the bottom, which is kind of sad. But there's uh, lots of these amphibians are living very aquatic lifestyles even as adults. Here's some more diversity of these early ones. This is a clade called Dyseropoids. So this is a very a specific subset of the list amphibian side of the temnus model tree, Dyseropoids. Dyseropoids are the group of fossil amphibians 
that for several character reasons, structures of their teeth and other things, uh, that we think modern day amphibians, especially frogs and salamanders, have pretty obvious connections to. And this is all kind of in the Permian for the most part, these animals, dysarophoids. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. Well, this one came out, I, I don't remember if it's the 80s or 90s. It's called Gerobotrachus. It was called the Frogamander because it has a bunch of features that are kind of froggy and a bunch of features that are kind of salamandery. Uh, it is not the animal that is the absolute closest, we don't think, to today's frogs and amphibians, but it is quite close itself. And there it is running a ruckus around trying to catch this bug <laughs> way back then. Uh, there's obviously some other very cool animals. There's a whole lineage um, known really well for places like Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico in the Permian that are fully terrestrial as adults. They're totally up on land their whole adult lives, we think, and only laying their eggs in the water. Cacops is a little armored dude, kind of like a very intense looking frog face. I think you'd agree. Uh, but he's got all this armor running along the back. You can see this huge scapula, huge shoulder blade for big muscles to attach onto. It's really walking around uh, a lot on land. And that armor is thought to fuse together and help make the body rigid. It's one of these ways these animals can become terrestrial, hold themselves up, and it's not at all what reptiles and mammals do. It's a different kind of way to do that. Platyhistrix is a fan favorite, of course, because it has a sail. You guys are going to see many, many times throughout the fossil record animals that just decide to get a big sail on their back. Platyhistrix is all by itself. It's a very close relative of Cacops. Cacops has armor. Platyhistrix has a sail. And that sail isn't made of armor. It's the actual spines on the vertebrae coming up really far, which is really cool. Nobody knows what color Platyhistrix was, but come on, had to be, right? Like, <laughs> had to be pretty. So anyway, these are the animals we know about, mostly from the Permian, uh, that are thought to be the closest relatives we have of things like frogs and salamanders. When I show you guys real frog and real salamander fossils, they're all from the Triassic, which is just off this slide. Um, you'll see they do look a lot like these dysrobloids. Comments or questions about these? Okay. So I'm gonna not go this way now towards us. Reptiles and mammals are right here and all these crazy characters. We'll do them on Tuesday. Like I said, we're saying goodbye. Whoopsie, whoopsie, whoopsie. We're saying goodbye to our ability to show one tree when we talk about all vertebrate diversity. So here's our modern vertebrate phylogeny. We've been building and building and building and building. We just spent a whole lot of time talking about tetrapods and there's those same eight tetrapod snape morphies that we talked about for the last like three lectures. Now we're going to talk about biodiversity of these fishy lineages during the Permian and the Carboniferous. We'll see if we can get it done. I think we can. So here's just a reminder, say adieu. This is the last time I'm going to show you, I think, this phylogeny. Because from now on, we're going to be moving forward in time, and these are going to be very old divergences. So you'll have to look back if you want to remember how they connect up. So the first one we're going to do, we were in tetrapods. So let's talk about some sarcoperygians. Um, first, and we'll work our way kind of back out. So here's some really fun uh, non-tetrapod hermocarboniferous sarcopterygians. Uh, they are still absolutely around. Coelacanths, of course, just keep going right on through. Uh, there's also two lineages I want to show you of these tetrapodomorph fishes. So these are fishes that are close to us tetrapods, not coelacanths, not lung fishes. And the Carboniferous especially. Uh, there's multiple lineages. The names are always going to be here on the slides of these freshwater predators. So kind of like the Devonian, there are still lobe-finned, mean-faced fishes eating everybody up uh, in the Carboniferous. So those swamps still have, despite losses at the end of Devonian mass extinction, there's a couple lineages of Sarcopterygians still crawling around on the bottom, still eating each other, still being the big predators in freshwater ecosystems. Something that I think is very cool is that this animal, which like, how great is this fossil? <laughs> and how great is that little body? <laughs> Pectoral fins, pelvic fins, ridiculous tail. That's an early coelacanth. So there's a lot of cool coelacanth diversity uh, in the later part of the Paleozoic. Um, they stay marine. Coelacanths are almost always only in the oceans. So these tetrapodomorph fishes are freshwater carnivores. Coelacanths, there's tiny ones, there's big ones, but they're all out in the oceans still. So there are still these low fin fishes that are pretty diverse. The other sarcopterygian lineage, of course, are lung fishes. And I actually think, besides one thing in a few weeks, this is the last time I'm going to talk to you about lung fishes, our closest living sarcopterygian relatives. And so in the Devonian, Sarcopter uh, lungfishes were super diverse. They had tons of different facial structures, tons of different dentitions. They lived in freshwater, they lived in the oceans, which is really cool. 
the Devonian mass extinction ruined lungfish's party. And basically since the Carboniferous, we've settled into what lungfishes look like and they pretty much look like this up until today, which is really interesting. So a very long and successful body plan. So what you guys are looking at, of course, is a lungfish coming up to breathe with its lung, which is cool. And then here's a lungfish's skull today. Big lower jaw, big upper jaw, still the same bones you guys know, dentary, maxilla. This though is a lungfish tooth. That's a one single big old tooth that sits on the roof of the mouth there. They also have some on their lower jaws. Lungfishes have four big teeth in their mouth. Lungfish fossils are super easy to find if lungfishes are in the habitat you're looking at because these are really hardy and really easy to recognize. They look crazy when you find them. I found lungfish fossils like where the tooth is like this big. You have to hold it like this. So big old lungfishes. And so Lungfish never really recovered from that extinction at the end of the Devonian. They were super diverse and did a lot of interesting things in different habitats during the Devonian. After that, they are only in fresh water. They reduce their skull bones to make them really reinforced and strong. And they get these giant teeth. They're called durophagus teeth, crushing teeth, uh, for crushing up things like little mollusks, things like snails and clams. And they basically look like this with some interesting variation, but mostly like this all the way through till today. So a setup in the Carboniferous that we're still kind of seeing. One thing that lungfishes do today that people have known for a long time is they aestivate, meaning their pond can dry out. Of course they can breathe as that pond is drying out. But when the water's truly gone, a lot of lungfishes, particularly the ones in Africa and Australia, can do this thing where they go down into the mud and secrete like a mucus cocoon and then like turn their metabolisms off and they just sit there and wait. And then when it rains again, they can swarm up back into their pond because their pond is back. If you guys want, you can look up some cool YouTube videos. A lot of people in Africa, uh, you can see who go like harvest lungfish. They walk around in like the dry mud of a lake bed and they just go like this. And then they hit a pocket, and, like it pops like a balloon, like water pops and they pull out this lungfish. Sorry, that's sleeping and is now gonna get eaten. But it's a cool thing. So there's fossils from the Carboniferous of, or sorry, from the Permian of lungfishes doing this aestivation process where as the water goes down, in their places they live, they can seal themselves up in this really cool cocoon. Lungfish are pretty special animals. Um, there's three genera today, uh, many species, uh, an Australian, uh, African, oh, is that South American, Australian, and African uh, genera today. The Australian one is easily the coolest, most ancient looking, I think. Um, but so love to lungfishes, say goodbye. I'll show you one in the Cretaceous, but otherwise <laughs> know that they're still here. Okay. So there's our permal carboniferous non-tetrapod sarcopterygia, some tetrapodomorph fishes, some steel cans, and some lung fishes. Now we're gonna go over here, actinopterygians, these ray-finned fishes, the most biodiversity of today. So here's a pattern of evolution across the carboniferous and the permian of actinopterygians. So there are tons and tons and tons of radiations of these fishes. It is a complete nightmare how they're related to each other and what their anatomical details are to unite them. The people who work on fossil fishes are all heroes because these animals are really, really, really homoplastic. They evolve convergently. They evolve to look like each other all the time in terms of their facial structures, in terms of their body plans. So pulling apart ecological adaptations from how they're actually related can be quite difficult. All I've given you is a scaffold of what's alive right now and its ancestry. So this big pile of fishes, which you'll learn the name of later, has a fossil record that goes back to here. These fishes are sturgeon and paddlefish. You guys have heard of sturgeon and paddlefish? Idaho has sturgeon, these big fishes that like lay eggs that we call caviar. Um, sturgeon and paddlefish are a separate lineage from this one that's most fishes today. And then here's that reed fish that you met uh, back in the Devonian. The fossil record for these fishes don't start till the Carboniferous, but the diversification from DNA, we're super confident for all the rapin fishes is way back in the Devonian before the extinction, which is super, super cool. So let me show you some of these animals that we have from the Carboniferous and the Permian. So there's a great name. I love to read it. I love to say it, Boba Citrania. Awesome, deep bodied fish. There are Boba Citrania fossils from Idaho. We have this fish here in our state, back from the uh, Triassic actually. Uh, here's a really early sturgeon relative called Tanyrhynichthys. It kind of looks like a sturgeon. If you know sturgeon, very armored. When people see sturgeon, if you guys Google pictures like on the Snake River, if somebody pulling a sturgeon up, they everyone says, oh, that looks so prehistoric. These are very ancient uh, armored looking actinopterygian fishes. So there's a sturgeon fossil called Tanyrhynichthys from the Carboniferous. 
And then here's a couple more fancy fishes, I think you might agree, that aren't actually part of today's living diversity, but you can see how these fishes kind of hit these different body plans. Do me a quick favor, talk to you for a quick second about these different fishes, some things you might suspect or uh, just any observations you might have. Okay, like which ones do you think are related to which maybe is an interesting thing to think about. It's very hard to pull fishes apart. Okay, I'll just do that quick thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they just but also a lot of water actually. All right, any fun, any observations? It's a pretty big scales. Yeah. Very big scales. A lot of the early axonops have like this like kind of intense almost armor. Some of the fishes today, like sturgeons along their backs, and then this fish, which we'll meet later, have really, really intense scales, scales that are really well ossified. I can even have enamel on them, so they make excellent fossils. We find loose fish scales a lot. So a lot of these early lineages, yeah, are kind of like almost armored in a different way than placoderms work. They have such thick scales. I hope you can see lots of body plan disparity. And one of the things that makes this hard is. So these fishes are both like very flat side to side, very tall. Like you can imagine them as like cute little butterfly fish, like swimming around kind of fishes. This one is from Australia, even aqua. And it's thought to go like right about here on the phylogeny. This one's called Discocera, also really similar body plan, but it's actually on the, this fish's lineage. This is a living fish, the reed fish. And there's tons of diversity on here. And the thing that makes my head explode when I try to think, how am I gonna teach a college class where we even talk about this at all is like, this lineage has this animal alive today, but like throughout the fossil record, there's tons of fishes that look nothing like that that are part of its clade. It's a nightmare. I don't even know what to say. I just show them to you and then I move on. Um, <laughs> but I have a big thing for fishes and you guys are gonna, I'm gonna force you to look at so many fishes as we keep going, but I'll try to keep it brief every time. Um, I'm gonna pause the recording real quick. So that's our actinops. I will leave that there for today. Now let's take a big turn. Oh yeah, we got time. We got a big turn. So we've done our osteotheans now, our sarcops from the permocarboniferous. I've shown you some pictures from 50 million years of time for all those fishes. Now forget it, you won't see them again for a while. Now let's go over to the cartilaginous fishes, which are doing some extremely cool things in the Permian and the carboniferous. So again, meeting some um, extant living biodiversity. There's two lineages today of cartilaginous fishes, chondrichthys. One is sharks and stingrays, which I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with, very biodiverse. The other one is not biodiverse. It's called holocephalans. Today they're called ratfishes or chimera. For the most part, they live in deeper ocean waters, but they can be found in shallow waters. There's this one species in Puget Sound, you know, where Seattle and Vancouver are, or like by biomass, it's like the most abundant fish there, which is really cool. Holocephalans are super interesting to me. Their locomotion is dominated by pectoral fin flapping. They go like this. That's how they swim. It's very much like they're skipping, I always think. A little bit of tail propulsion, of course. Um, they are really, really good durophages. They crush things up, but they're also predators. They have very intense, what we call tooth plates, like single big structures that are just like solid and don't replace themselves very often that they use to crush up food. So tooth plates are a big feature of them. You can see very interesting heads and headgear. A lot of the coolest features you'll see on these animals are like from those people that send down those rovers to the deep ocean to like look around. And you'll see these things, chimeras or ratfishes kind of come out of the depths, do something cool and <laughs> swim away again. So these are them. Uh, the living ones, just like you saw some other living ones, but they have some really, really, really wild fossils. So let's talk about some Permian and Carboniferous holocephalomorphs, things that are related to today's holocephalans. Look at all these clades. I'm not going to talk to you about all of them. I just want to show you some of these clades. 
Here's some fossils. Balancia is from uh, Montana. Genasia, I think, is from Europe, if I remember right. There's their fossils. Here's what they both look like. Here's a kinochimera, also from Montana. I'll let you look at that for a second, try to decide what you think it looks like. <laughs> There's a whole lot of these animals. I remember that they're swimming with their pectoral fins. Something that's really, really amazing about these ones, especially this clan is called Eneopterygian, is they have tons of features that could really only be sexual display, horns and spikes and frills and fans, like all over their bodies. Again, these are all ocean animals. I should have said these are all ocean animals. But look at this flat, very like uh, dorsoventrally, we'd say top to bottom, flattened, living like almost like a ray lifestyle. But these are a kind of polycephalomorph. These big crushing teeth, really, really, really fun morphologies, crazy stuff. Uh, I put it up there. I don't know why I'm saying it and putting it up there in text for you guys to see. So you can check the slides. These guys get me excited. If you feel like it, drive up to Bozeman in Montana, go to the Museum of the Rockies, which is Montana's big state museum. There's a great display of these fossils because so many of these fossils come, come from a place in Montana called Bear Gulch. So we live really close to where a lot of these fossils come from, of these carboniferous, um, wild chondrichthians that are related to today's chimeras, today's ratfishes. Really cool. But, like drum roll please, the animals that are the most famous relatives of today's ratfishes and today's chimera are these animals, Idaho's own Helicoprion, the buzzsaw sharks. So these are some fossils that have been known since the 1800s and have caused people a lot of problems. You can look at it, you can tell it's shark teeth, but you're like, why is it a cinnamon bun shape? What's the deal? So these are the fossils we actually have. When you guys come down to the museum and lab, I will show you all the ones from Idaho. Uh, the Helicoprion, which is the name of this one that's in a big circle. It's called the buzzsaw shark. There's Helicoprion's little face. That's actually all that we actually know about Helicoprion's true morphology. Uh, specimens from our museum here in Pocatello were scanned and we could see the cartilaginous lower jaw and the cartilaginous upper jaw. So we know Helicoprion's face looks like that. Once you go past the head with like the different fins and things, we don't know 100% about Helicoprion. We know it was huge, but the buzzsaw shark is not a shark. Shark is a misnomer. It's related to chimeras. It's related to ratfishes. It is in no way a shark like today's sharks. This is a very extreme morphology to have a spiral of teeth. And what's very cool to me is that there's tons of animals in this clade that have variations of that structure that aren't as extreme. So you can imagine the eventual evolution maybe of a full circle that spirals on itself. Because there's animals, this one's called Adestes, that have these different um, whorl structures in their mouth. Tobias is studying these fishes. He could probably tell you a lot more than I could. <laughs> but. Here's just some cool uh, paleo art of them. So there's one of those Ineopterygians, a little holocephalomorph trying to live its best life. I think it's about to get got by another relative of its. Uh, it's also a holocephalomorph relative called Edestes. Edestes is called the scissor shark, whereas uh, Helicoprion is called the buzzsaw shark. Edestes is thought to have this like interesting joint of cartilage here that lets it like really swing those blades out and do like crazy scissor style ways of feeding. These are insane animals, and you're right to shake your head and be like, I don't get it. And I think that's great. <laughs> We're going to talk about other versions of this later for different animals for different ways. But I love fossils when they make people come to museums, and then those people are like, I don't believe that. And you're like, well, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> There's the rocks. This is what it looks like. Uh, so let's try to figure it out, huh? These are extremely cool. Helicoprion especially was very likely at the end of the Carboniferous and in the early Permian, the largest vertebrate on the planet. So not a shark, but a ratfish relative, a holocephalomorph. You guys will see these. If you're from Idaho, which most of you are, have pride that this is one of Idaho's absolute gold standard fossils. Uh, I think it should replace Hagerman, but that's personal opinion. <laughs> So here's something I wanted to come back to. I showed you this, not from lecture one, sorry, technically it was lecture three, but from the first time we all met, I showed you this slide. I think vertebrate paleontology is interesting, but it's really only interesting if it helps you get a scaffold for all the stuff that's actually alive right now. And when you guys met all the different clades of vertebrates that are alive right now, there were some like mammals that I knew, you probably knew what mammals are already. But now at this point in the class, You've met hagfish, you've met lampreys, you've met chimeras, you've met coelacanths, you've met lungfish, and you've met sicilians. So now I hope 
that vertebrate biodiversity is getting a little clearer to you. And you can see why animals like this still being alive really helps us understand bigger picture vertebrate stuff and contextualize a lot of the fossils that we do find. So it's very cool to me that we still have lung fishes. It'd be so sad if they were extinct because that helps us understand a lot more about the fossils we actually do find. There's that. Again, same thing I just said. There's our proper sharks up there. Helicoprion goes with this one, which is so cool. Okay, speaking of proper sharks, when you get into cartilaginous fishes, when you get into chondrichthyes, as we always, always, always see in a monophyletic group, there's a split. On one side, there's a monophyletic group today called holocephalins, ratfishes, with a bunch of crazy fossils that you just saw, that's here. The other side of cartilaginous fishes today is this node, and that node is called elasmobranchs. Elasmobranchs are a very biodiverse group of fishes. They're very important ecologically to today's oceans. So let's talk a little bit about elasmobranchs. I'm going to give you guys two features, two synapomorphies that unite the living elasmobranchs within cartilaginous fishes. There's two things they do. One is their tooth replacement. This is probably super known to you guys. Sharks lose their teeth. You find shark teeth on the beach. You find shark teeth fossils. Shark teeth fall out. You can get them at a gift shop. So the way elasmobranchs replace their teeth is starting from the back and working forward. A tooth doesn't even necessarily wear out as much as the next one's coming in so fast it just falls right out of their gums. So this really advanced kind of conveyor belt of tooth replacement, here's a shark's lower jaw. In life, there'd be gums covering up these teeth and only these ones would be exposed. That the shark. Here's a ray. You guys might not think of like stingrays like this, but there's an eagle ray. So Mr. Ray from Finding Nemo for the connoisseur. Uh, and here's his conveyor belt of teeth that come out. They're very flat. Rays are crushers. They're duraphages, crushing up hard stuff. And so these teeth fall out one by one as they get to the front of the mouth. And there's a whole line of teeth that are coming from the back and growing in together again like a conveyor belt. So that really fancy tooth replacement is an elasmobranch feature. The other thing that elasmobranchs do that other chondrichthians, especially the living holocephalans, do not do is have really intense skull mobility. This has a very uh, specific name, the architecture of the jaws. I'm not going to give you that name because I'm not going to give you all the other ones that exist. Um, but they have the ability to like sling their jaws forward. Those holocephalans you've met, the ratfishes, they have a very fused up skull. They can go like this with their jaw, but they don't have a lot of movement within their skull. It's called cranial kinesis, movement within your head. Uh, the kinesis, the mobility in living elasmobranchs is extreme, and it has to do with features you guys already know about. Here's that neurocranium made out of cartilage in a shark, so it's called a chondrocranium. That is the vertebrata synapomorphy, the skull of vertebrates. And then here's the gill arch one and gill arch two. That gill arch one is literally the jaws. It has teeth in it made out of cartilage in a shark. And these are only attached to that skull in a couple of loose places so they can really move a lot. You guys have seen this before, whether you realize it or not, of course, because a shark swims around and looks like that. But when a shark does something scary, it looks like that. And so its jaws can literally like come off from its brain a little bit. You saw that when I showed you jaws the first time and you saw that goblin shark go like this around a fish. So this great white shark can literally drop that upper cartilage, that first gill arch that's now the upper jaw, the palate quadrate cartilage. It can drop it away from the brain case to oh, grab some prey. So that intense skull mobility and that pattern of tooth replacement are unique to elasmobranch fishes today. I want to try to show you guys in the last few minutes here some Carboniferous and Permian elasmobranchs. So there's a whole bunch of shark words up there. Don't worry about remembering them, of course, but I hope you can see there's a bunch of cool stuff. Devonian sharks existed. True things, sharks. That was sharks in quotes on all your previous slides. Now you're getting all the names. And of course, within living chondrichthians, here's your holocephalans right here. So as you probably expect, most of the fossil record of Paleozoic sharks and Mesozoic sharks and Cenozoic sharks is teeth because their bodies are cartilaginous. They don't make excellent fossils. They often are lost, but their teeth are really hardy. Their teeth make great fossils. So for the most part, shark taxonomy and shark evolution is known from loose teeth. Luckily though, there's plenty of places throughout earth history where we do get good shark fossils. So here's this first clade called Samoriomorphs right here. Talk to each other for a second. Tell me about samoriomorphs. Samoriforms. What am I talking about, samoriomorphs? <laughs> That's a walking animal. Okay, sorry.
Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of refined. Yeah. They were, you know, they did not possible features. I don't want to find those. 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 I don't want to Emotionally yourselves. I've heard this just fossil by professional paleontologists described as erotic. <laughs> I'll let you decide what you think about that. Okay. <laughs> so there's this dimorphism in a lot of these groups that's super weird, where like you find the exact same shark with a giant brush on its first dorsal fin, and then there's one that you find that just doesn't have that at all, it's just a normal dorsal fin. So is that male, female? Are these different species? These are really interesting questions because they're mostly identical. Falcatus, this fossil especially is a really great example. This male has, I can call it a male because it has claspers coming off its pec pelvic, or sorry, pelvic fins, yeah. So all chondrichthians have claspers. So you guys know that when sharks, I showed you that image, when sharks mate today, stingrays do the same thing, but when sharks mate today especially, the male really bites onto the female's pectoral fin. She has really reinforced pectoral fin, like scales, armor almost, so he can bite on while they're mating. This is the male has this handle. And so people are like, does she hold the handle? <laughs> That's crazy. These look a lot like display structures. Display structures evolve in animals all the time. Even animals like sharks that you guys might not think about display to each other in their body language and their coloration today. So here's Stethacanthus. This is a relative of it. But look at that fossil. On top of that structure, which is the dorsal fin, there's like tons of scales that are, of course, homologous with teeth that are like much bigger than the others. So sharp, brushy stuff. So brushing up against each other, like body rubbing and kind of coming along is a very common thing in a lot of fishes, a lot of amphibians, a lot of reptiles, a lot of different animals in the mating process. Look at these big, like beautiful ribbons that come off the pectoral fins. The ones that don't have the brush also have the like ribbons. What's the deal? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to get some goggles and a snorkel and find out? I do. So these are some really early sharks, early, early elasmobranchs. You can see they're even related to the ones that are known from the Devonian, those Cladosalache, which you already met. They live in the Carboniferous. They don't go on all that long. Here's two more groups, the Xenocanths and the Tenocanths, which if you're a paleontology student, are really frustrating because those names sound so similar. They have very different ecologies. Xenocanths are freshwater animals. So they're in the lakes and the rivers. They're not really in the oceans too much. Uh, they're very elongate sharks. They have fins often that run along their whole body, which is very different than what most sharks have today and most sharks even in the fossil record have. Um, the thing that they do have that's really fun is they have this one big spine at the front of that fin that sometimes is placed all the way up on their head. So a fossil you find of, of uh, xenocanth that aren't their teeth are oftentimes these big spikes that are part of their dorsal fin structure, which is really cool. So these are aquatic predators for the most part. Whereas tenacids are kind of everywhere. They're mostly marine, but you do find them in fresh water. This little cutie pie with the paddle nose is a little tenacanth shark called Bedringa. It's definitely from fresh water and it's very, very cute and very small. Some of them are not small. Here's Cybotis, which is a huge shark, uh, bigger than great white sharks today that existed back in the Carboniferous. And you can see a lot of these animals have those spines at the front of their fins too. So fin spines and teeth are really common shark fossils. Here's a big fin spines from Cybotus. You can see it's got all these cool ornamentations on it. It's got like spikes in the back of it, little called denticles on the back of it that are very sharp and really intense tooth diversity. So here's this fish, Tenacanthus, which is the namesake for this whole clade. And you can see that's what the tooth is shaped like. There's five points on one tooth, a big central one, and then five other cusps. So there's tons of dietary adaptations. You've got crushers, you've got hard thing eaters, you've got soft thing eaters, you've got saws, you know, eating big fish probably to like cut through big pieces of meat. Very interesting ecology, very fun stuff. I think these sharks never really get their due for how interesting they are. 
Uh, next plate up here is these hybodons. Hybodons, I think, look a lot like sharks that you guys are expecting. And you'll see that arrow goes off the screen. Hybodons are a big part of Mesozoic oceans. When dinosaurs oops, fall in the ocean, a hybodon takes a bite. Like, that's not weird. You're going to see a lot of hybodons. Hybodons are really famous for those spikes. So you saw spikes at the front of the fins and all those acanthodians, which aren't even necessarily crowned nathostomes, all of them. And even in some of these elasmid ranks, we keep going on with these fin spines leading the edge of the pectoral fins, the dorsal fins especially, kind of all throughout their history. Hybodons are pretty cool. There are some extremely cute hybodons that are freshwater that are this big up until not that long ago. So we did have freshwater sharks all over the world for quite a long time, but most of them were like fun size. So it wasn't so much of a problem. Here's some mystery taxa. I'll try to show you in the last two minutes here because I have no idea where else to tell you about these. I, if you can't tell, because I'm not bleeding it all over you, I love biodiversity. I think the past and how life has looked is really cool. Instead of, because of time, I'll just show you these. Here's a bunch of sharks from the Paleozoic, from the Permian, the Carboniferous, that no one really knows what to do with. We don't know where they go. Um, Orotus is known from like almost its entire skeleton, and we still don't know what it is. It has the tiniest fins, but it's a shark. Lystracanthus, all we have from Lystracanthus are these, which are definitely shark spines, or sorry, shark scales, but they're all long and hairy. So I have no idea what Lystracanthus looks like. Nobody does. But like, we know that there's a shark out there that has like bristles that are, you know, tissue wise, the same as other shark scales. And then there's things like this. What are we doing? <laughs> this Ely sharks. I love it. And I just want you guys to see it too. I have no idea where to put those five animals or four animals in this phylogeny, and nobody does. I think that's really special. So think about all that evolution that's happening that we're missing because it's not becoming a fossil or it's only becoming one fossil. All right, last thing I'll show you today and then we'll be done is this. One of the best places in the world for cartilaginous fish fossils from the Carboniferous is actually in one of our national parks in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. So you might go to Mammoth Cave because it's like an awesome cave. You might think caves are cool and there's a dead mammoth at the front, which is kind of fun. But in the rocks that make up that cave, that cave is made of limestone, are these carboniferous age rocks that are completely full ecosystem. So all these invertebrates, all these ratfish relatives, all these sharky sharks, things like that, really fun. I'll give you this picture again with some labels if you wanna look anything up. Uh, and I wanna be careful about the time here because I did take it all. Um, so I won't ask you any questions, but take this in. I don't think I would scuba dive in this ocean, <laughs> but it is super cool. That's the one that's like 30 feet long right there that you already saw. But look at all this awesome diversity of cartilaginous fishes in the Carboniferous. So post Devonian, the new fish rulers. Okay, I'll stop there for now and I'll see you guys on Monday for lab.